Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome, a welcome to you if you're joining online. We greet you in the name and in the love of Jesus, all of you who are gathered here in person. We do also. Please take the friendship pads, pass them down. If you're visiting with us and haven't filled out a First Connect card ever or lately, please do that. You can drop it in the offering for me. You can also, though, do it with the QR code. And you can also sign up for Wednesday night with the QR code for that. So if you, if you like to use your smartphone and would prefer to do it that way, let us know you're here that way and uh, give us a contact information. I'd appreciate it. Uh, we have great celebrations today. We're blessed to uh, announce that Dean Franklin has been approved for ordination and installation, and so we're on track for that. That happened yesterday at the Presbytery meeting. Uh, Dean was examined and approved, so we're really excited about that. Let's give thanks to God on that. And then we look ahead to November the 13th for his ordination and installation service in the 1030 service. Not the 830, but the 1030 service. So uh, that's, that's coming up, so we're excited about that. Uh, now, uh, also, if you haven't turned in your recommendations or suggestions to the nominating committee, go ahead and get that done today or the next couple of days as they are moving well through their first phase of process and into their second phase in, in the upcoming weeks. So uh, please do that if you would. Today, a very poignant note, um, Dr. Bruce Leopold had been on schedule and had contacted us about a week and a half ago and wanted to give the flowers for this Sunday in appreciation for all. You know, I've, I've been featuring Bruce and some prayer requests for you and uh, your prayers and love and cards to him over the last few weeks and last few months, really. And then, as you saw in my email on Friday morning, I learned Friday morning that Bruce joined the church triumphant, possibly Thursday night, possibly early Friday morning. And so that was a surprise. And this is a first for me in pastoral ministry where the person who, um, you know, was planning to be here for his first time back in worship on a Sunday and gave the flowers um, as he looked ahead to that and looked for some procedures coming up medically. Um, he's in the church triumphant now. So that's a poignant note and just kind of, we love Bruce, uh, give thanks for his call to the church triumphant, miss him, but the flowers today are from Bruce who put that in motion well before the Lord called him to the church triumphant. Uh, Reed uh, is gonna lead us in our call to worship. Would you stand for the call to worship this morning? This morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. But this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Ascribe the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Would you remain standing as we sing Psalm 95?
be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Almighty God, in your great mercy, you've gathered your people together. You've gathered us into your visible church. And we ask today that you would grant us hearts that aren't distracted by the trappings of the world, by the idols of the world and its gods, but would you sanctify us today to worship you in steadfast faithfulness and purity? Lord, you are spirit. So teach us to honor you both in spirit and in truth, both in spirit and in outward form. Help us to glorify you. And by the gift of your spirit of grace, would you nurture in us a living and active faith that seeks your will and seeks to know you and glorify you in everything we do. And Father, we ask these things because we know who we are. Without your grace, our faith is dead. Without your grace, our works are filthy rags. We profess faith in you, but we fail to sing your praises. We fail to open our mouths to proclaim your name. And instead, we turn to the very idols that you condemn. And so we come to you this morning confessing our sins together, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared unto all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, the most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Now would you lift your silent confessions before God. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. Make speed to save us, make haste to help us through the saving work of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, people of God, would you rise to your feet and lift up your hearts to the Lord as we repeat the assurance of God's grace from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hebrews 10, 32-34 says this, But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Brothers and sisters, since we have a better and abiding possession, don't be afraid of the world's changing times and situations, but give freely as God has blessed you. Let's pray together. Merciful and gracious God, you've given us more than we could ask or think, and we ask you this morning to accept the offerings we bring for your glory. Bless our gifts by your grace to be of service to our neighbors and to advance the kingdom of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we give all thanks and praise to you on this Sunday. As we come before you, we rejoice in who you are. We rejoice, Lord, in your holiness and your majesty, and we rejoice that by your grace and in your saving and redeeming love for us, you invite us in to be in your presence, to glorify you, to approach your throne of grace with confidence through Jesus Christ, our Lord, your Son, and his blood shed for us, that we may know once and for all that, Lord, we belong to you in him, and by your Holy Spirit testifying within our hearts and souls, our spirits, that we belong to you, Abba and Father. And so we praise you. Lord, we come before you today and we pray for those who are on our continuing prayer list. We certainly pray for Jack Forbus and others, Lord, who need your healing help this week and in the coming days. We continue to lift up the family of Sylvia Love and pray for your comfort and care to them, even as we rejoice in the call of the church triumphant. And most especially today with the poignant reminder of the flowers even provided for our worship of you today by Dr. Bruce Leopold, our brother. We grieve, but we rejoice likewise that he has been called to the church triumphant. We give thanks for Bruce, our brother. And Lord, we trust in your perfect timing, your providence, your care. And we rejoice in the good news of our salvation. Lord, we continue to pray for our world in a season of darkness and brokenness and wars and rumors of wars. We pray for the situation in Ukraine. Lord, we pray, Lord, even as mass graves are uncovered, as, as cities are, are set free from occupation, Lord, that, Lord, healing might happen and, and strength and hope, including to those who have lost loved ones and are realizing for sure that those loved ones are gone from this earth. Lord, we pray for a revival in the land. We pray for brothers and sisters of the Christian church there in that nation and, and throughout that region of uh, Eastern Europe and, and moving into the area of Russia and the former Soviet Union more broadly. We pray, Lord, for brothers and sisters in the Middle East, in Africa, in, in North Korea and elsewhere, Lord, under persecution. We pray for the strengthening of your church. We pray for churches stricken by the massive flooding in Pakistan and involved in mission responses. Little minority churches there, Lord, strengthen them. May they be, Lord, amazingly effective and fruitful and encouraged in this season. Uh, Lord, we pray for mission workers otherwise in that region. We pray for brothers and sisters in Nigeria, those under the threats of the Boko Haram and, and other groups. Lord, strengthen the churches there. Lord, we rejoice in the cross of Christ for Starkville being raised this past Thursday. And we rejoice in all the ways you show us in our own lives and in our own households that you are wonderfully at work for your glory and for our good. And in all these things, Lord, we come before you and pray the way you teach us, saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare this Sunday to share communion next Sunday on Worldwide Communion Sunday, I encourage you to continue in this season of prayer and preparation on which we focus throughout this Sunday. Uh, to the extent it is up to us, may we be ministers of reconciliation within the church with fellow brothers and sisters. If there be any divides, any things that need to be addressed and certainly outside in the world, uh, God bless you as you move forward in faithfulness, and may the Lord sanctify you as you seek to serve him and yield yourself to him in repentance and in renewal. Along those lines today, we continue in our message series, Grow Closer to God, 
Today's sermon is know God's will. Know God's will, and then the tagline on it, back to the present, back to the present. Know God's will, back to the present. I want to invite you to pray with me again. Lord, speak to us, Lord. Not, not my words, not my thoughts, not the thoughts of anyone participating right now, but Lord, your word, your sure and saving word. And may we receive and believe and be saved in and live in your word through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So again, today's sermon is no God's will back to the present. We're going to begin with two scripture readings from the New Testament. We're going to focus for a third of three Sundays on a central and pivotal scripture in all the New Testament and certainly in Paul's magisterial letter, his epistle to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Romans 12, 1 through 2. And then today, we're going to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And you'll hear the echoes in the relationship of, of these two passages from Scripture having to do with living the Christian life. So here now God's Word. First, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, or holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual, your informed, your word-informed worship. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and, and pleasing, acceptable, what is good and pleasing and perfect. Now to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Therefore, notice there's another therefore. Therefore, another pivot. Peter says, preparing your minds for action. Preparing your minds for action. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means his coming again at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Peter is quoting from the Lord's word recorded in Leviticus, for instance, in the law of the Old Testament. You shall be holy, he says to his people, because I am holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. How can I know God's will? A common question, people seeking faith or people seeking to be faithful who already believe. Often ask this question as a pastor. I receive various versions of this question and people dealing with various contexts and challenges. How can I know God's will? Well, as we reflect on pursuing a biblical answer to that question, I want to pull back and remind us on a lighter note about the 1985 blockbuster movie, a Steven Spielberg production, Back to the Future. You may have never seen Back to the Future, or it may be way before your time, but let me remind you and tell you about this movie. It was a really popular movie, and it 
fit right within the middle of the 1980s, a different era, and uh, certainly a very funny and fun movie in a lot of ways. In Back to the Future, the storyline revolved around uh, a high school kid named Marty McFly, who was really smart but always doing too much and never on time. He was always running late. In the movie, he's moving around on a skateboard all the time, trying to flip over people and do amazing stunts on his skateboard to make up time and try to get places on time where he needs to be when he's running late. That's kind of the introduction of Marty McFly, a real smart, a little bit of a smart kid running late. Um, and what happens is Marty McFly has an unusual friend a mad scientist who's brilliant, nice, brilliant, but has come up with a, an amazing thing. What he's been working on, his name is Doc Brown, and he's been working on a contraption. He's taken an old DeLorean sports car, and Doc Brown has turned it into a time travel machine, or what he believes will be a time travel machine. And in the story, what happens is, accidentally, Marty McFly driving that DeLorean is transferred, transported, total time travel, back in time, transfer in time from one age to another, from the middle of the 1980s, 1985, back to 1955, a very different age for our purposes in American culture and history, very different time. He's, he's transported, he's transferred from one age to another, 1985, 1955. And the thing that's interesting about 1955 is that's when Marty's own uh, parents are in high school. And sure enough, he is transported back to their period and their time. And he's even going to high school at their high school. But the problem is this creates a dilemma. Somebody traveling in time can throw off all of history and certainly his own history. In fact, it will set off a, a domino effect that could, you know, totally, Doc Brown is totally anxious and concerned about this and saying, you've, you've got to fix what's happened and get back to where you belong. So what happens as Marty McFly is dealing with his parents at the high school age and, and you know, the hometown back in 1955, one of the immediate concerns is Marty's mother-to-be in high school is not at all attracted to his father-to-be. And one of the things that Marty thinks he needs to work on is get them connected. And as it turns out, uh, Marty's mom strangely has a crush for a while on him as the new kid at high school. And Marty really wants to redirect her, obviously, away from having a crush on her own biological son who's been transported from one age to another. Complicated, comic, that type of thing. And, and, and Marty has to make sure that he gets things arranged that are back on course for the future. And then he needs to hit a time frame where when a lightning bolt strikes the old clock tower in the middle of town, he's there with the car um, connected in a way, power sourced in a way where he can shoot forward and have enough uh, power to get back to the future. What is for him the, uh, in 1955, the future, back to 1985. Well, today's sermon, I've subtitled it, Back to the Present. Because I think this is a good way for us to understand the, the back to the future kind of silly story allows us to understand the amazing uh, and, and deep theology and message of the gospel that God brings to us throughout the New Testament, elsewhere, as well as Paul's letter to the church at Rome. In Romans, Paul declares that the gospel is the power of salvation for everyone who believes, believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew, but then also the Greek or then the Gentile as well. So everyone, there is one gospel, one way to salvation through this gospel in Jesus Christ. And in saving us, as Paul develops in the book of Romans, the gospel transforms all of life and transforms all that we are when we believe in Jesus. And in addition to that, as part of that, in fact, <clears throat> the gospel 
time transfers us. Time transfers us so that we belong when we are saved to eternal life or literally to the age that is to come, the age and the reign of God, the kingdom of God. So we are transferred from the power, from the realm, and from the age of sin and death. It's basically the world and this age following the fall. We are under, as Paul explains in Romans, we're under the law and in the age of sin and death. But when we believe in Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you are not only set free from your own sin, Christ redeems you, you are set free from the entire realm of sin and death and transferred into the power of God, the kingdom of God, and the coming age of righteousness and the reign of righteousness and eternal life in Christ Jesus. And this is all in accord with you want to know God's will. Here is God's ultimate revealed will for us that we would be new people in Jesus Christ, that we would be transformed and brought to conform to the image of his son, Jesus. Or as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this is the will of God, your sanctification, our sanctification, our being made holy in Jesus. It's incredible. And again, what is being said here is that we are transferred in time, so to speak. And in the New Testament, and definitely the book of Romans, talks in terms of indicatives having to do with past, present, and future. So that, for instance, we are saved when we believe in Jesus, we are being saved, and we will be saved. All three, they're not exclusive. They all go together because, again, we belong to the kingdom uh, that has broken into this present age and has broken into us that we might be transformed and transferred. So we're, we're being saved. We will be saved. We have been saved. We are justified. We have been justified in Jesus Christ. We are being in the present justified, and we shall be justified in Jesus Christ. We are sanctified when we belong to Jesus. We're set apart unto Jesus. We're, we're made holy. But we are being sanctified, and this is a process of our Christian life and faith in which we're called to participate and yield to God's work by his grace and his spirit in us. And we shall be sanctified. Likewise, once again, we have been glorified already by belonging to Jesus, being saved in him. We are being glorified, but we're not where we want to be yet. We shall be glorified in fullness when we see Jesus face to face. And that has to do with our future glory and inheritance. But you can hear that the tilt in all of these, what this all points us to is eternal life, life in the age to come, life that is belonging to God in eternal grace. And so we are focused on where we're going, and then we are sent back in God's perfect will, back into the present. See, what this is saying is, what this is saying to you when you and I believe in Jesus is you're already a child of God. You already belong to his kingdom. You can already rest assured in your salvation in Jesus Christ, not because of yourself, but because of Jesus and, as Romans is emphasizing, his righteousness, which is imputed to you and imparted to you and at work in you. Now, yes, though, at the same time, the present age, back to the present in which we live, is under the reign of sin and death. And as Paul says in Romans, also under the law of sin and death. But see, here's the incredible good news. You and I, when we believe in Jesus, we don't belong to the realm and really belong being people of sin and death. We're in the present age as missionaries and witnesses, but we belong in eternal life in the kingdom of God. For instance, Romans chapter 5, verse 21. Romans 5, 21 says this, so that as sin reigned in death, grace, so sin reigned in death, over in this present age, right? Uh, 
grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is God's will, and that's the gospel call and plan, God's revealed will, and that's where he's taking us. I've already mentioned that his will for us, as Paul says elsewhere in 1 Thessalonians, is our sanctification. We belong to God's reign, God's kingdom, God's realm, and eternal life in Christ. We are of that kingdom, of that life that is of God. Likewise, we emphasized this in last week's sermon. Let me go to this again. Romans 8, 29. Toward what end does God predestine those whom he calls, those whom he foreknew and predestined? Well, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined what? To be conformed to the image of his son in order that, listen to this, he, Jesus, in other words, might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now that's looking ahead to the glory that is to come. These gospel indicatives are clarifying and make sure for us when we believe in Jesus, God's perfect will for us. Now, these are God's gospel indicatives and they then lead to God's gospel imperatives. In faithful following, in faithful following, I'm called and you are called as Christians to test and discern what is in accord with God's will. Remember, we've got the big picture, the large template of what is his uh, revealed will for us. And this is his perfect will, not a concessive will. It's, it's his big game plan through the gospel for where we are headed and where we already belong, where we already have a place. We then look back to and deal with our life here back to the present from that big picture view. And in that, we are called to discern, to test and discern God's will back to the present, back in the present. So what God's will calls us to do is to present our bodies a living sacrifice every day in every way, wholehearted, whole life, Christian discipleship. You can listen to the sermon from last week. We talked about this on every day in every way. Then I wanna go back to something we've already mentioned and I've emphasized before, but I'm gonna emphasize it even a little more firmly today with this living sacrifice language. This is radical language that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It would have struck Paul's readers and listeners in Rome as an oxymoron. It's, 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 it's interesting and challenging language. Paul says zoanthusion when he's talking about living sacrifice. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here, here's the thing. Living, we can understand living, alive, living. But then the, the term uh, thusian, it, it comes from a term thuo, which, which means to kill and sacrifice as a sacrificial offering. So literally what's being said here is that we are pre to present our bodies a living, killed, sacrificial offering. On the face of it, that's what, that's what Paul is saying. What is he talking about? What he's talking about is a new way of life and a wholehearted, whole committed way of life on this side of the once for all sacrifice that Jesus has made to set us free and to claim us so that we are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. Our bodies belong to Jesus. Our lives, our hearts, our souls belong to Jesus. So Paul says, present your bodies literally as a killed living <laughs> sacrifice. And this then brings us to this interesting observation and challenge. If we are to be a living sacrifice on the altar of dedication to Jesus Christ and witness to the world, there should be no crawling off the altar. No, no body, no one of us, none of our bodies should be crawling off the altar. What I mean by that is this, you know, many of us might, it might be easy to say in a time of great inspiration or everybody else is doing it, so I'm, I'm gonna do it, or I'm, you know, I really need the Lord, so I'll do it for right now, to give ourselves and even give our bodies, the fullness of what we do with our bodies, as a living sacrifice for a couple hours at a retreat, at a worship service, in a time of great need. 
But what happens a couple of days later, or a couple of months later, or a couple of years later. And what happens with many of us is that we are sorely tempted to crawl off of the altar, to not, in fact, give ourselves and certainly our bodies fully to the Lord. You know, it's, it's okay to do it when we really need God, but when it's inconvenient, that's a different conversation. When it's inconvenient for our other agendas, perhaps for a relationship that we're involved in, in countless situations, I've talked with, prayed with young people and older people as well who make a real commitment to now be pure and to belong to the Lord and to live according to biblical standards. But, you know, then somebody of interest comes along and this may be the right person. And so I'm willing to negotiate and compromise, perhaps. The person might say, look, I know uh, he or she is not really a committed Christian, or I know I'm having to do some things that aren't appropriate for a Christian, or I know I really wanted to give myself to the Lord, but right now I have some other obligations, and this may be the love of my life, or I'm really busy with school, or I'm really busy with my job right now, and we tend to crawl off of the altar instead of continuing to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We make compromises. So what should we do in response to this? Well, the scripture is clear. We are to present our bodies back to the present, trusting in where we're going, and to reject what is trending. Trending, that's a big term in this era. Uh, what's trending? We have to keep up with what's trending. Here's trending. Here's a news notice of what's trending. Here's what's trending on social media. Here's what's trending on the internet. Here's what's trending in the culture all around us. But we are called by God's word here to reject what is trending and to reject conforming to this age. Because here's the truth. What we've already said is actually the reality. This present age the age of 2022, the age of 2024, the age of 2028, is all virtually dead history. It is so yesterday. All of this, 2028 is so yesterday. Well, we will have to keep up to keep up with 2028. No, no, no. It's yesterday. It is a dying. It's already on its way to the grave very quickly. Do not think that you're keeping up with things that are current, that that's the way to move into the future because its future is dead in the water. Don't be shaped by what is from the grand scheme of things. When you belong to eternal life and belong to the kingdom of God, what is so yesterday? Don't cave into it. Yes, minister in it. Minister in the midst of it, but don't be of it. Don't be shaped by the futility of their mind their worldview, their will. Uh, Romans 12 says, verse 2 says, don't be conformed. Uh, Ephesians 4, verses 17 and 18 says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So don't be shaped by the futility of their mind. Their minds are futile, those who belong to and try to keep up with this current age that's dying in sin and death. You belong on the winning team that is going to the glory of God. So also don't set your mind on the flesh living by the law of sin and death. Don't follow the laws and the expectations of this age. It is a challenge right now for Christians, for people inside and outside the church, definitely though for Christians. This past week, Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway Research published their report, The State of Theology for the United States Population in General, and then also specifically and most tellingly for people who are evangelical Christians. These are people who... Uh, belong to churches and affirm the idea that, you know, you're saved through Jesus Christ, that you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So that, that would be some framework for who's evangelicals, church members of, of churches that proclaim the gospel of Jesus in, in a broad sense. Well, what's going on? Well, the, the Ligonier and Lifeway research every couple of years 
does a diagnostic uh, test on 35 questions. And I'm just going to highlight three of these. And the first one has to do with the general U.S. population response. True or false, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. When this survey had its first year back in 2014, 41% uh, of U.S. adults agreed with that statement. Fast forward eight years now, in 2022, 53%, the majority of U.S. adults concur that the Bible is a helpful uh, compilation of a number of myths and other religious ideas, but is not actually true. But more disturbing than that are the trends of Christians and evangelical Christians, where, where our heads are, where the general people who identify as evangelical Christians are. True, false. God accepts the worship of all religions equally. In 2016, amazingly enough, already 48% of members of evangelical churches agreed with this statement. There's really no difference. God really doesn't care. God just loves kind of anybody who, you know, whatever worship suits you is totally fine with him. Whatever religious expression of that worship is fine. General tolerance, a pluralism, that type of response. Now in 2022, 56%, the majority of evangelical Christians agree with this. It makes no difference. However you worship, whatever language you use, whatever gods you turn to, it's about all the same. And then let's go to the heart of the gospel. This question, true or false? Jesus was a great teacher but he was not God. Jesus was a great teacher, but he's not God. In 2020, just two years ago, already 30% of U.S. evangelicals, this makes no sense in evangelical, U.S. evangelicals actually agreed with the statement that Jesus is a great teacher, but not God. Two years later, 2022, incredible growth in that percentage. Now, 40 3%, nearly one half of United States evangelical Christians, people who show up in churches, who go to big auditoriums, listen to lots of loud, inspiring contemporary music, and people who show up in smaller churches and sit in pews in traditional evangelical type churches. All 43% of these folks agree that Jesus is a great teacher, but certainly not God. The scripture calls us to reject conforming to this type of thought, to this, the tendency of this age, and instead to have our minds renewed and be led by the Holy Spirit and cry out in love and adoration and relationship to God, Abba and Father. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 17. This is the direction of the scripture. Let God renew your mind in eternal things back to the present so that you can test and know God's will. You can be holy in all your conduct. You shall be holy, as God says in Leviticus and repeated by Peter in 1 Peter. You shall be holy because I am holy, God says. You're going to be different. You're going to be different than the world in this age. All of this kind of reminds us that in our faith, we're a little bit analogous to a situation where imagine you're on a, a sports team in which you have a leader who, by his presence, guarantees that you're going to win the championship. If you know that, and if you know you've already been told you're going to win the championship, you're going to be wearing the championship rings. You're going to have the trophy because he's going to share the victory with you. It's, it's, it's a done deal. It's going to happen. Well, back to the present, when you're going through a season with ups and downs and challenges, first of all, it takes a whole lot of pressure off of you. It's not on you but you're called to be faithful and to engage with the team. Another thing is, in addition to not being under the pressure, you can begin to enjoy and rejoice in the ways in which you see the story develop. It's amazing to see the gospel story develop in your own life, in the lives of others, even in hard times, even in dark times. And the challenges of the present season, you know, we had a bad week. I was injured in practice. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm ill right now. It, it's not working out. I've had a setback. 
that doesn't mean those things are great, but we can rejoice in God's bigger story. And if I'm on a team where I know the end is sure, I'm going to share in the victory, the championship is secure, then I don't have to be overwrought with the present temporary challenges I face. So it is with us as Christians in this life, in this world. We know the big story and we are headed already. We already have a place in glory with Christ. It's already made for us. We're already on our way. In fact, we've already been in a sense shown a glimpse of that, a taste of that. We've had a taste of that. And then back to the present, we can live faithfully in the midst of these days, this age, but to do it in the love and in the joy of Jesus Christ. So we're not hostile. We don't have our backs up. Instead, we are missionaries in this world in which we are. We're not of the world, but we are in the world. And so living that out, uh, Paul in Romans chapter 12, picking up at verse three and moving through the rest of chapter 12, tells us how to live in the gospel imperatives of, of living back to the present, knowing and growing and understanding and discerning God's will. So how do we do that? We live as people of Christ, as disciples of Christ. And this is very similar to what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. To begin with, Paul teaches us that within the church, we are to be humble and actively using our gifts in the service of God in the church. And then in the world, we are to have and to show forth love in both our attitude and our actions. So loving attitude, loving actions, certainly within the church, and, and Paul goes back and forth here talking about our relationships within the church, but also out into the world and with our neighbors, and yes, definitely with uh, enemies of the faith and personal enemies of us. We are to be gracious and loving and, and to to reflect Jesus out in the world. So let me read through these, these verses, and then I want you to meditate on these and return to this passage. This is how we live out our lives as Christians who belong to the kingdom and belong to eternal life, sent back into the present to live out in the present. Four, the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. There's the humility within the church and then heading out in the world. Not to think uh, of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul's talking about spiritual gifts and calling here. Uh, for as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, not gritting your teeth, with cheerfulness, being merciful and forgiving to others. Uh, let your love be genuine. This is beginning within the church and then expanding out. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. I've mentioned this in another recent sermon. Let me remind you, this verse, verse 9 and verse 21, our framing verses, verse 21, we'll get there in a minute. I'll go ahead and give it to you in advance. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So good, dealing with evil, love, and genuine love. So let love be genuine again, verse 9. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So within the church, a powerful communion that again is going to bridge into the way we are witnesses out in the world. Certainly the way we come to the Lord's table as we prepare for next Sunday. Uh, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant or devoted in prayer. Preached on this recently. You can go back and listen to that sermon. Romans 12, verse 12. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless, verse 14. 
now looking out into the world, bless those who persecute you. Bless, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one. Let me repeat this. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is enemies of the church, enemies of, of you personally. Live peaceably as, as much as it depends on you with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, Deuteronomy there. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. This is your enemy now. Give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We know the victory. We know the Lord who is the love of our lives. As we come into his presence, as we are already assured of our communion with him, his presence with us here, back in the present, back, back where we live right now, and our communion with him in the kingdom and in the heavenly realms and in the heavenly places. Let us love Jesus, trust in him, and live in the power of his gospel grace in our hearts and how we understand our times and how we are witnesses and missionaries where he has placed us back to the present. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And praise be to God for his will for you and his gospel grace for you in this calling, amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we rejoice in your calling to us. We rejoice in the majesty and the power, the saving power of your gospel and the amazing way we can understand how we are to live our lives now as part of the big picture, connected always with you and your victory and your glory and our place with you forever. So we need not fear. In fact, we have the opportunity to be joyful and even to count it joy when we face trials of every kind. So Lord, if we're struggling right now, and I pray for anyone who's struggling right now with understanding what's going on in their life, with challenges, with concerns, may they lift them up to you now, Lord, and cry out and say, Jesus, renew me. Let me find in you the answers to know the Father's will and to live in that strength and that power. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Father. I give myself to you. I yield myself, trusting in your righteousness, in your right plan. I believe in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. And I pray that you would be strengthened in your mission in the world. God is calling you. When you believe in Jesus, God is calling you as a missionary and a witness for him, wherever he's placing you in the paths that he leads you on this very week. Be strengthened in Christ. Don't rely on your own understanding. Trust in his understanding. May your mind be renewed always so that you may, in the word of God and according to his will, begin to grow and discern in his will always in all your situations. And as you go, may he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you his peace, and before you to show you his way now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.